morning. Good, Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Good morning, Christina. Good morning, Cynthia. Hallelujah. There's Hello, Susan. Susan. <laughs> Today, we are studying Second Chronicles chapter 2. We've now come through First Chronicles, which is primarily the life of David, and now we're moving into Second Chronicles chapter 2. Posing a question in this chapter as we study it, did immigrant labor build Solomon's temple? Interesting. You know, Solomon was a 12th century B.C. version of Donald Trump. <laughs> and uh, we know that's one of the controversies on the political scene. Donald Trump is being so brutal with it the immigration issue, but yet Donald Trump employs illegals in his vast holdings, excuse me, undocumented uh, immigrants. Jesus. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it's a salient question that uh, we're going to stumble over this morning. And again, it's one of those things where the uh, narrative of the scripture drives the experience, an issue that that is uh, at the fore of the American political scene right now, uh, happens to be something that we see reflected in what we're going to consider today. In this chapter, Solomon contracts with Hiram to provide further building materials and labors for the work of building the great temple. Now, the last few chapters, it's been all about how King David spent decades gathering workmen and material and then he opened David before his death he opened up the opportunity he showed the people what he had given he opened up his finances which again is something that uh, leaders are asked to do here in the United States is to you have to make your if you're going to run for public office you have to make your tax returns public knowledge or at least yeah, they're not required to do it, but it's expected. Right. And I don't know any that don't do it and haven't done it. Right. And David basically did the same thing. It's he let it be known how he had gone into his own personal fortune to fund the, the temple. And we talked about how there's giving strategies. You know, we you can give to an anointing, you can give to a need, but there's something else about leading and giving is that leaders need to lead in giving. Leaders need to lead in giving. Leaders are always looking for ways to motivate people, particularly in the church, to give. Politicians are looking for ways to motivate people to be taxed. <laughs> and uh, leaders lead in giving. Uh, we did a, a meeting, prophetic meeting in Kansas City uh, this weekend. And as we were on the way back, just when Kitty and I do drive time, it's one of those times we have this, these protracted conversations and God enters into the conversation. Amen. And uh, one of the things that occurred to me, just meditating in some of the many things we discussed, uh, I thought about givers, people who give. Givers repel non-givers just like oil repels water. Mm. Givers repel non-givers, just like oil repels water. And then my next thought is, well, you probably wouldn't want to have it any other way. Because if you are surrounded by small-minded people uh, with, uh, with not an open heart, whose hearts are not enlarged, would be kind here. We could get on the soapbox, but I don't think that'd be productive. Uh, whose hearts are not enlarged in giving, they, uh, uh, there's a contamination involved in that. Uh, it does not go well with people who are more uh, self-referred than they are God-conscious, mm -hmm. specifically in that area. 
uh, I believe it was Solomon said, I've seen a sore evil in the earth, riches held back by the owners thereof to their own hurt. And so uh, as a giver, you want to draw givers to you. And if non-givers are recourse, when non-givers are repelled, they don't say, I just hate you because you're such a giver. That's not what they're going to do. They're going to find something, what they feel is legitimate uh, vulnerability in your life to accuse and point the finger at. So, you know, persecution does not come. People are not going to come up to you when Jesus said persecution comes. Uh, they don't. They persecute you for righteousness sake. They don't come up to you and say, I... I hate your guts because you're so godly. No, <laughs> they're going to go through your life with a fine tooth comb and the things they would completely dismiss and sweep under the carpet with those that they do love, they will pull out in your life and wave it like a banner and tell everybody about it and start the rumor mill. Whereas in their own lives or the lives of someone dear to them that they're invested in, they'll just totally sweep that under the rug as though it's not an issue. So uh, many times, you, Good Christians, good brothers and sisters feel guilty because their lives are not perfect and and their and their faults and failings are being trotted out by others all in the name of godly exposure of evil. Right. But the fact of the matter is the motivation behind g giving you a hard time is because your testimony uh, convicts them. Your testimony offends them. And so just something to think about. Uh, and uh, but here, after all of that, is what's interesting is after gathering workmen and materiel for decades before Solomon became king, now Solomon gets involved in the process and he brings almost a hundred, actually, I think he brought almost 200,000 people in specifically. Can you imagine you do the work. to work on the temple? of Solomon, thousands upon thousands of primarily immigrant workers. And you know, that wasn't any more popular in Solomon's day than it is today. There is a, a xenophobic attitude that people get, an insular attitude, a protectionist attitude that a nation who thinks they have something to lose will get toward outsiders. And so this was not any more popular. And you know that's true because you know what the word for uh, a non-Jewish people was in Solomon's day? Gentiles. It's a word for dog. They were dogs. Wow. And how much more so do we see how, how Hispanic people get treated? And let me tell you something. African Americans who've been in this country for hundreds of years the disdain that's heaped upon African Americans in our country is primarily because they came here as immigrant labor. Now, they didn't, they came here forced to come here. Right. They were captive in slavery and sold on the auction block. But the core hatred, look, it's not about the color of your skin. The color of your skin might be the excuse, but you get down to the core of, of racism, and the core of racism is because when uh, uh, the African-American demographic was brought to North America, they came as forced immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take advantage of somebody financially, if you're going to take advantage of somebody to your own benefit, to your own purposes, you have to dehumanize them. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what, what we see. And yet we see Solomon here. I wonder how he treated them. I wonder if he paid them substandard wages. <laughs> uh, we can also in this study, and, and, and again, please understand, those of you that know me, I'm not trying to make this my stump, but this is the chapter that's in front of it's us. where we're living. <laughs> and uh, we're also going to look at the archaeological proofs or the lack of proof that the temple ever existed or that Solomon actually lived for that matter and have a conversation about that from the perspective of historical criticism coming out of the learned institutions and seminaries of the day. <laughs> we also will look at the precious few artifacts. It's very fascinating that the only artifact that exists that even conceivably might have been connected with Solomon's temple is a little 44 millimeter amulet that 
is thought to have been on the staff of a priest as an ornamental amulet of a pomegranate. Wow. And you think about something smaller than the palm of your hand. And it's one of the most prized it's one of the most prized archaeological treasures in the museum in Jerusalem. So we'll begin Second Chronicles two. Don't mind the puppy banter out there. They see a squirrel. Well, the puppies are in trouble. The puppies decided <laughs> that it You're was gonna air the laundry it was Steve the McQueen. Puppies. Remember the movie Steve McQueen and the Great Escape? Well, the puppies they thought it, they could dig a tunnel and get out from under the fence. And the ground is muddy. And the ground is muddy. Hello. And so we have two-toned puppies right now. Yes, two different colors. So they're out on the porch, screened in, away from the mud. <laughs> Well, we try to have a Bible study. So they're <laughs> glory. Welcome so, back, Sarah. Glad you made it back so, from Israel. Yes. How's the bacon? I love the <laughs> post that you made, Sarah, about, bacon. about how you haven't smelled bacon for two weeks. Glory. Yeah. Yay! Well, I bet she had a bacon sandwich uh, as soon as she got home. <laughs> BLT. Uh, verse one through what, sweetheart? Four. One through four. Um, chapter 2. And Solomon determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And Solomon told, uh, told out three score and ten thousand men to bear the burdens, and four score thousand to hewn in the mountains, and three thousand and six hundred oversee so them. Seventy thousand, eighty thousand, and three thousand. Just in that. And that's not all of them. That's just one that's part of them. That's part of them, huh? And Solomon sent to her. Hiram, the king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David my father, and didst send him cedars to build him a house to dwell it therein, so even uh, even so shall deal with me. So deal with me. Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, and to burn before him sweet incense, and for the continual showbread, and for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moons, and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Now, to clear up a little confusion, you notice he called him Hiram, and that's spelled H U R A M. It's actually Hiram, mm -hmm. but Ezra. Uh, mixed these two names. There is someone called Hiram connected with Hiram. He, Hiram was a servant of Hiram, but Ezra just made one of those typographical errors like I do occasionally where he just simply switched the names and so that there'd be no uh, confusion there. Now, so in this chapter, we see that Solomon proceeds to further make preparation for the building of the temple of God in Jerusalem. In addition, he adds to the project at this time is a house for his own kingdom. Notice that he tells Hiram and he it says at the beginning of the chapter that he is uh, building a house for the Lord, but he's also building his own house. And it's interesting because you see a, a generational characteristic because Centuries later, when the second temple is being built, this temple that we're talking about here gets destroyed. And then later in Haggai's time, Haggai, one of the books of the Bible, one of the minor prophets, uh, they are, uh, Haggai rebukes them. He said, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses and the house of the Lord lie waste? You will find that in the end, and we studied this in uh, First Kings, that Solomon actually put more effort into building his own palace and a palace for the daughter of uh, Pharaoh, who is one of his wives, than he did into the temple. Hmm. And it, it's, it's an echo of, of things to come and the problems that Solomon got into later. So we also know from previous studies that he plans to build a house for the daughter of the king of Egypt and becomes his wife. Now, in our treatment of Solomon, when we look at Solomon, we focus on his wisdom and his wealth. But the writer of Chronicles, if you're looking at this from the perspective of what the author gives attention to, he's not thinking about Solomon's wisdom and he's not thinking about Solomon's wealth. He's thinking about the building of the temple itself. Uh, he see, When he thinks of Solomon, he thinks this is the guy that built Solomon's temple. This is the guy. He didn't, he, the other stuff was just ancillary 
to the subject matter. It's like, what is of interest to you? Uh, Solomon is recognized as both wise and wealthy, but his greatest achievement from Ezra's point of view, who wrote this book, is the construction of the famed Temple of Solomon. Everything we know about Solomon is secondary in the writer's mind to the building of this great building as the center of Jewish devotional life. Now, Solomon contracts 80,000 common laborers just to query the stone for the work. You got to understand, this is not on the job site. This is just querying the stone. 70,000 burden bearers. You ever, you know, you go out on a construction job and you think a guy is out there making $20 an hour and all he does is carry a two by four around. And if you're a part of the local uh, union, uh, I've, years, years ago, I lived in union country uh, where the industries were all over and construction was a constant thing. And there were guys that I pastored, and I said, what's your job? He said, well, my job's walk around with a two-by-four all day long. And he got paid $20 an hour in 1980 to do that. Wow. And uh, so these guys were burden bearers. These were, there were 70,000 porters, and these are not skilled, skilled laborers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were also contracted. And then of the 80,000 common laborers to quarry the stone and 70,000 porters, there were 3,600 overseers or what we would call foreman. Just for this part of the work, this is not the building. This is just getting stone out of the ground, out of the quarries to get it built, to see all these things are done expeditiously. And what's interesting is in all of this, the Bible records consistently when things are built and people die. When people are maimed, when people die, you get injury reports as you study in the Bible about cities that get built and someone who's injured, someone who dies, it's real common. The man that rebuilt Jericho, Joshua prophesied the man that rebuilt Jericho, he would lose his oldest son in the foundation of it and his youngest son in the finishing of it. And the guy that rebuilt Jericho, that's exactly what happened. His oldest son died uh, when he began yeah. building and his youngest son died when he finished it. And uh, so these things were, records were kept. And what's interesting here is here we have over well over almost 200,000, uh, a workforce of 200,000 mm -hmm. that came in. And there's not one report of a workplace incident, not one. And it was seven years in building. So for th seven years, you have this massive workforce and not one of them got sick wow. and not one of them died. That is a miracle. You see that whenever you're driving around and you go up next to a construction site, the biggest sign you'll look at is it'll be 135 days and you know exactly what it means without an accident. And then the next day you're going to work, you drive by there one day because you know somebody got hurt, went to the emergency room. My goodness. So additionally, Solomon appeals to Hiram, the great commercial ally of his father, David, to assist him in the work that he, as he had so done for his father. Hiram helped David, was a big part of David's life. And now Solomon saying to his daddy's friend, well, I need your help. Now the actual existence of biblical figures is often brought into question. One of the, um, in, during the age of reason, what is known as the Age of Reason, named after a book, a very secular, atheistic book written by Thomas Paine. Um, uh, one of the, the things that came out were these schools of criticism. And a school of criticism is not an actual school. It's a school of thought regarding the scripture. Up to the time of Thomas Paine, the scripture was studied from a perspective of what they call sacred criticism. They would look at it and they would inquire after it, but there was a baseline understanding the Bible is infallible. And But after Thomas Paine's time, and, and I'm not suggesting he had much to do with that, but in the influence of his time, uh, these schools of criticism arose, textual criticism, where they pick apart the text and they claim, well, this one was plagiarizing this one, and this one couldn't have written this because it was written hundreds of years later. And, but then there's historical criticism that looks at the Bible and tries to find in extra biblical histories any reference to the biblical story. And so, in other words, does it exist elsewhere in the historical record. Now, archaeologists, interestingly enough, let's talk about Hiram. Uh, archaeologists have uncovered a sarcophagus 
from a 12th century, which would be about the right time, uh, the 12th century, 1200 years before Christ, with the inscription Ab Hiram, which Ab would, would imply father. And so there is uh, apparently mention of this, this is the king. They, they don't know, they, they might not want to agree that that's who it is, but his name, his location, and everything about him fits. Sarcophagus being the body or just the tomb? It's like, uh, the, the not the tomb, but the, the coffin. The coffin of. Like a mummy's sarcophagus, oh, like King Tut. <laughs> King Tut. Um, so that's very interesting. And something else that's interesting, now realize that, this chapter that we're reading is quoting from two letters that are written between Solomon and Hiram. They're writing letters to each other, and Ezra's quoting these letters. So this, and then 1,200 years later, the letter that Solomon wrote to Hiram was purportedly available to the first century historian Josephus. Now, Josephus was a contemporary of Jesus' day. Some 1,200 years later, Josephus claimed to have access in the historical records available to him uh, to the letter that Hiram and Solomon, the letters that they shared, he claimed he had access to them, as old as they must have been. Hmm. And he mentioned this in his well-known writing called Histories of the Jews, where he even talked about Jesus. It's interesting that Josephus talked about Jesus and uh, he mentions him, he mentions Jesus of Nazareth, the man Jesus of Nazareth, if it be lawful to call him a man. Mm. But scholars that come afterwards say that is a Christian um, uh, corruption of the text. They said that a Christian rewrote that. Come on now. And that Josephus would not have likely have had those thoughts about, about Jesus or even mentioned Jesus. They think that he... And a Christian came along just to prove the point and forged the words of Josephus and that Jesus really wasn't known to Josephus. That's just plain unbelief. <laughs> and uh, Solomon indicates to Hiram his determination to build a temple to the name of the living God. Now notice he's actually building a temple to God himself, but this is Solomon's choice of words in order to avoid invoking the actual name of God which is held sacred then as it is by many today. Uh, in other words, the unutterable name of God. The name Jehovah is actually three consonants put together. It's, actually, it's in truth, it's the name Jehovah in Hebrew is not pronounceable uh, because it's two consonants with a uh, unspoken consonant in the middle. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, conservative Jewish believers and, and Christian believers many times uh, you know, that instead of writing G-O-D, they'll say G-D. So they don't say To it. make the name so, of God mm -hmm. unutterable. And, and quite honestly, you know, you see that sometimes it might kind of irk you a little bit. It's like a religious spirit maybe. But uh, look at, the, as I was studying this, I was looking on the other hand, and I see uh, how many of you get around believers, and, and they're talking about uh, what a good... Uh, uh, Two for twenty deal is on at Applebee's, and one of them goes, "Jesus, yeah, and my God, not and, necessary, and even things like gosh, G, and that that kind of stuff. That that's all. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Help and, us, Lord. And it is such a, a common part of our vocabulary, and so it's worth noting how that Solomon, in talking to Hiram, he was very conservative of how he handled the name." of God. Uh, I don't think we would be, uh, um, I don't think we would be lessened. I don't think our vocabulary would be lessened by taking on that same mm -hmm. approach to the name of our God and the name of our Savior. And so if you'd read verse 5 through 10 now. And the house which I built is great for the for great is our God above all gods. So who, Solomon is writing to Hiram. Okay. But who is able to build him a house, seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I then that I should build him a house, save only to burn sacrifice before him? Send me now therefore a man cunning in to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in iron and in purple and crimson and blue that can skill 
to grave the cunning men that are with me in Judah and Jerusalem to well, I'm sorry, whom David my father did provide. Send me also cedar trees, fir trees, and algum trees out of Lebanon, for I know that they, thy servants can skill to cut timber in Lebanon, and behold, my servants shall be with thy servants, even to prepare me timber in the abundance, for the house which I am about to build shall be wonderful great. And behold, I will give to thy servants, the hewers that cut the timber, 20,000 measures of beaten wheat, and 20,000 measures of barley, and 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Wow. You know, people say, where's the transfer of the wealth? You realize these workers represent us, and Solomon is a type of Christ. And notice what he gives, wheat, barley, wine and oil it all represents the things that god will pay into our lives many times people where's where's all the money going to come from where's the transfer of the wealth well are you one of his workers are you building together you know paul said we are a, a temple builded together by god and all of us are those builders and uh, solomon specifically asked for a man skilled in metallurgy and precious metals and we can also see that in calling upon Hiram's assistance, that Solomon, and here's the point, he's using non-Jewish -Jew labor, both common and skilled labor. He's also using building materials that do not originate in Israel itself, but rather from Gentile lands. That may not mean anything to you and I, but you got to understand, whenever they would not allow the sound of a tool upon stone to be heard, at Ornon's threshing floor when they built this temple. Mm -hmm. This was a very sacred thing. It wasn't like today, you know, where you, you know, the, they're building a church and they got three guys over here uh, chewing tobacco and another guy back there having, having a six pack after work with his buddies on the tailgate of his vehicle. And, and no, that is not how it worked. This was a sacred place. And so it meant something that Solomon would use materials that didn't originate in Israel mm -hmm. and use workers that did not originate in Israel. Israelite culture at this time, it has been shown, they didn't have the technology or the skills to produce the quality of work that ultimately the temple that Solomon built reflects. In other words, they built something Honestly, think about Kennedy when he challenged the United States to send a man to the moon in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't do that today. You know, that, that would be something that would be so gargantuan that would probably encapsulate everything we're spending on the space program up to this point. It would be almost impossible for several reasons for us to send a man to the moon again. And that's why you don't see uh, honest plans and open and transparent plans about sending someone to Mars. They toy with the idea to capture the imagination of the people, but there's no concrete plans. We've got we have a uh, we have a space uh, uh, agency almost in name only because we're nothing compared to what we were. But the point being that Solomon, in building the temple, he's going to build something beyond the technological capability of the people. It would be like if we said we're going to build the Star Trek Enterprise in the next five years, and it's like the technology doesn't even exist uh, to do such a thing. Well, that's what Solomon did, and he called on the people to help uh, make it happen. Solomon called on uh, foreign assistance to help build a house to the living God. Uh, in our country, we called on foreign assistance. We brought in Nazis to help build the atom bomb so we could blow up other other cities and other nations. My goodness. You know, think about that, how that so much of the technological breakthroughs that happens is in pursuit of taking the life of our fellow man. And it just that just gives me pause. It's like there's a book about... Uh, called The Healing of the Masculine Soul, and the writer made the point, he said, isn't it amazing that the greatest feats of heroism and those that are awarded the highest honors are awarded so in the taking of human life? Tragic. And again, I'm, I'm very patriotic. I understand the need to defend our country, but it's got to give you pause. Uh, and that's why the 
the movie uh, about Chris Kyle. I don't know Chris Kyle, know anything uh, about him. And I know he was trying to help uh, troubled vets when he died. And God bless him. And I'm sure he was very proud to defend his fellow soldiers. But again, here's someone who was almost having a cult status, but it's in the taking of human life. And it really gave us pause when it came to, well, aren't you going to go see that movie? Don't care. Had a, I just had a problem with that. Not that I thought it was immoral, but it's that whole thing. Where is the greatness uh, that exists in doing something positive like what Solomon did in the building of the temple? Just something to think about. Um, and it's also interesting that the temple used immigrant labor materials that did not originate in Israel and the fact that you could tell from there that if they brought in architects that they borrowed Phoenician designs. In other words, they, it's like we have Greek columns and so on and so forth in modern architecture. Mm -hmm. Solomon was doing the same thing. These were, not, or these were not original building methods. They reflected methods that were used in Phoenicia. And so verse 11 through the end of the chapter. Then Hiram the king of Tyre answered in writing, which he sent to Solomon, because the Lord hath loved his people, he hath made thee king over them. And Hiram, moreover, blessed be, said, moreover, blessed be the Lord God of Israel that made heaven and earth, who hath given David the king a wise son, endued with prudence and understanding, that might build a house for the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And now I have sent cunning men endued with understanding of Hiram my father's, and the son of a woman of his daughter of Dan. His father was a man of Tyre, skillful to the work in gold and in silver and in brass, in iron, stone, in timber, in purple, in blue, and in fine linen and in crimson. Also to grave any manner of graving, that's to us is engraving, and to find out every device which shall be put to him with the cunning men and with the cunning men of my Lord David thy father. Now therefore, the wheat and the barley, the oil and the wine, which my Lord hath spoken of, let him send it unto his servants. And we will cut wood out of Lebanon as much as thou shalt need, and we will bring it to thee and floats by, the, by sea to Joppa, and carry it to up to Jerusalem. And Solomon numbered all the strangers that were in the land of Israel, after the numbering wherewith David his father had numbered them. And they were found a hundred and fifty thousand and three thousand and six hundred. And he set uh, threescore and ten thousand of them to be bearers of burdens and four square thousand to be hewers of the mountains and three thousand and six hundred overseers to set the people a work. Now let's talk some more about the archaeological record. In the archaeological record, there is no evidence that Solomon's temple ever existed. Furthermore, there is no mention of the temple in extra biblical histories written at the time. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. Be one thing, well, it got obliterated, okay, but there was no mention of it even in contemporary histories. Now, I'm not saying I don't believe it existed. I'm just pointing something out. These are things that you need to know. Otherwise, you'll be talking to somebody and they'll start spewing all this stuff out and you won't have an answer to it. <laughs> and uh, so because of political and religious sensitivities, there has been no modern archaeological excavations done on the site in search of proof. Remember that after Nebuchadnezzar destroys Solomon's temple, this temple is not the one that Jesus stood in. This temple is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, what they call the Restoration Temple was built. It was destroyed during the time of the Maccabees, the intertestamental period, four or five hundred years between the Old and New Testament. And then Herod built a third temple. A lot of people don't realize that. They say, oh, Jesus was at the temple, Peter and John at the temple. No, this is not the one that Solomon built. That one was destroyed. Then another one was built on top of it. And that one was destroyed. And then another one was built on top of it. That was the one in Jesus' day that has now been destroyed. Herod's temple. Right. Uh, the Wailing Wall, interestingly enough, and you just have to bear in mind now, the Wailing Wall 
is not the wailing wall of Solomon's temple, but rather the wailing wall of Herod's temple. And Herod was not even uh, fully, fully Jewish. Suggestion that he might have been half Jewish. And he wanted to be king. He wanted to be the Messiah. wanted to be acknowledged as king of kings. And so he built uh, the temple. And uh, which, again, that, that casts dispersion on the sacredness of the structure. You know, I think I would feel differently to reach out and put my hand on the wall of Solomon's temple than I would to reach out and put my hand on the wall of Herod's temple. Now, listen to what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody. But if we're going to believe something, let's base it upon truth. If it's Herod's temple that stands, and that's a whole other question of whether that is even a, temp, a, a wall that was associated with the structure of the temple, because Jesus said that not one stone would be left standing. Well, that is a very large wall that is attributed as being a wall of the temple. Well, then Jesus gave a false prophecy because there's a huge wall with stones standing one upon another. There's nothing false in Jesus. And so I studied that out, and there was a question. I said, now, if Jesus said not one stone is left standing, then Jesus gave a prophecy that didn't come to pass because the, that wall stands. But then I did some searching on that and found archaeological insistence that that wall is actually part of a causeway between that Herod would use so he could walk to the temple high up above the unwashed masses. He had his, his private access way to the temple mount and that this wall was actually part of that causeway and not part of the actual temple itself. Mm -hmm. Study it out. It's worth looking into. And so if we're wailing, are we wailing for Herod? <laughs> or are we wailing for something else? What are we bemoaning? Just, just saying. Mm -hmm. And I realize that could just be so unpopular. Unpopular with unthinking people. You know, don't you suggest. Oh, don't you. No. Do your homework. Do your homework. <laughs> let's, let's look into these things. Uh, while the existence of the temple from the standpoint of historical criticism uh, is strong, there are tantalizing suggestions of its origin. In Tel Aviv, there is a journal that uh, was unearthed 600 years after Solomon's time that mentions the temple. Okay, now this is not an official history of another nation. This is just somebody's diary, and they're talking about the temple. You mm -hmm. see, historically, uh, in, from the perspective of historical criticism, scholars question that Solomon ever lived, that David ever lived. Oh, come on now. They deny. They can't prove it. They can't prove it by a standard that they would hold it to. And the fact that the Bible says so, well, they consider the Bible's an absolute myth. And so they're looking for extra biblical sources. And the only reference we have is someone in their diary, in their journal, you know, somebody posted on their Facebook 600 years after the temple, something about the temple and that reference is there. And there is also a 44 millimeter amulet dating to Solomon's time that is inscribed with a reference to the temple. And that particular artifact is one of the most prized items of biblical antiquity uh, in one of Israel's museums, although authorities claim in Israel that it's a forgery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an ancient forgery, although they say it does date to the time frame that supposedly Solomon had built the temple. So just think about that. Something that is smaller than the palm of your hand, the only thing left. Okay. And that's considered a forgery. <laughs> so whatever the archaeological record may or may not confirm, as Christians, we believe, see, many times we won't look at these things and then we get challenged by, by others. We're put in a position and we can't answer for ourselves because we don't look at these things. I study where we get our Bible. I study, you know, when you, most people, their faith would be severely challenged if you just gave any thought and any inquiry into where the Bible actually came from. And I don't mean it came from God. Yes, I understand that. And from a devotional standpoint, I believe that. But I'm talking about the chain of evidence mm -hmm. that brought this book to us. And you begin to study that, and most people, their faith is utterly shaken. Not mine. Amen. I delight to study those things. 
it strengthens my faith. That's right. I, I love to face that, that challenge of looking into that and then coming back to the baseline of Christ, who Jesus is on the inside of us and what it means for us today. One day I may do an extended series on where we get the Bible. It's absolutely fascinating. We'll do that in your spare time. Honey. In the spare time. <laughs> Not enough for us Walden to go around. Uh, a note here about the literacy of Solomon and Hiram. This correspondence between Solomon and Hiram was in written form, yet centuries later, 2,000 years later, we find English kings who could not write their name. Now stop and think. Back then, over a thousand years before Jesus, we have two kings writing letters and being able to reliably send messages between one another. Two thousand years later, we find in the Middle Ages, English kings who could not write their name and could not read. You see how that you know we always think of the evolution of human society as going from something primitive to something more sophisticated but that was not the case after the fall of rome the world was cast into a very deep well called the dark ages mm -hmm. and where there were things that the that the romans did that were fantastic it would be like going if we went back a thousand years and found a spaceship or a spaceport uh, you know, that was what it was like for the people from the Dark Ages to go back and study the ruins of ancient Rome and Greece. They were much more, thousands of years before them were much more technologically advanced than they were in the Dark Ages. Right. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. The ancient world, even in Romans times, Roman times was highly advanced and technologically sophisticated. And much of this cu culture was lost in the fall of Rome and the onslaught of the Middle Ages. So in his letter, Hiram blesses the name of God with great veneration, and whether or not Hiram was a true believer in monotheism, we cannot say, but we do see the influence of his friend King David upon him in his interactions with Solomon. In answer to Solomon's request for a skilled metallurgist, he sends his servant Huram, who apparently is half Jewish himself. Hiram also agrees to Solomon's offer of payment in barley, oil, and wine. Many commentators scorn Hiram for taking compensation for his labors in spite of the fact that Jesus emphatically states uh, in the kingdom of God and the work of the gospel that the workman is worthy of his hire. It's like A.A. A. Allen said, some people are more godly than God. Some people are more critical than God. Some people's idea of holiness is more holy than God's idea of holiness. Uh, this statement by Jesus that the workman's worthy of his hire uh, affirms both the validity, validity of compensation for the servants of God and acknowledgement that the payment they receive is higher for their labors. <laughs> Rejection of this thinking is re, or repudiation of recompense for ministry services is a dispersion on the teachings of Jesus himself. Right. In the last few verses, Solomon takes a separate census of the immigrant workers who were aliens and strangers in Israel, and they numbered almost 200,000. Even in ancient Israel, an immigrant labor force was necessary in the construction of the temple and probably many other public and private works. How different would your city look? How different would city services and the, the, and the uh, skyline of your city be if you just simply took immigrant labor out of our history? Mm -hmm. What would evaporate? What would not be there? Where, where would the gaps be? Oh, goodness. You see, in our day in Western culture, we despise immigrant peoples and their labor, but the fact is, country that built on it, that their existence in our borders is as necessary as our borders themselves. Amen. Without an immigrant workforce, the Temple of Solomon would have never been built. Without an immigrant workforce, much of America and the Western world would not look like what it does. Amen. And we, we impose the vitriol upon the immigrant culture because of what we see, jihad and, and, and things coming into our our uh, 
homelands. And we see that as a threat from the immigrant population, but why is that? God sent the Babylonians and the Assyrians into Israel because they forsook their God and gave themselves over to idols. So who was the problem? If Israel was overrun by, by foreign powers, it's not because it was not the foreign powers fault. It was because they forsook their God. And so as face answers to face in the glass, nationally, what we see and culturally as Christians in the Western world, what we see in despising the immigrant is a reflection of what's going on in our own heart and life between us and God. And from a national standpoint, God is confronting us. Do you understand? Yeah. God is confronting no us kidding. with ourselves. And the spite for which we despise the alien is a reflection of something desperately wrong in our relationship with God, nationally speaking. Mm -hmm. And it's something that bears thinking. It goes back to when we were teaching on this uh, in earlier books of the Bible. Right about God warning them time and time again, do not despise the alien, do not despise the uh, stranger. And during the time we were teaching that on the news at that time in uh, Arizona and in Southern California, there were people coming out with baseball bats and blockades and blocking buses full of children, mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. and terrorizing buses full of immigrant children that had come up from uh, Colombia and other, other countries because they didn't want them here. And they were, and, and to this day, you can find pictures of little children, almost toddlers, in chain link enclosures that look like Guantanamo. My, my. And, and yet we, somehow we think, you know, we're, we're the nation, one nation under God, and 90% of the gospel goes out from the United States and God will never allow consequences to come upon our country come because on. we're so godly. You know, God defends the widow, the hireling, the orphan, the orphan. Jesus. And, and if, unless we want to just extract that out of our thinking and then become more political than we are spiritual, mm. we just need to stop and think about this. The temple of Solomon would not have been built without immigrant labor. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would remember mercy where judgment is due, that you would remember mercy, Lord God, and that you would forgive our land for rejecting the immigrants in Jesus' name. Father, give us give us leaders in our land. It doesn't it doesn't um, Un make you unhappy for us to ask for leaders who would love the immigrant, the foreigner, and the stranger, that you want all to be included, that your creation is important to you, and you've taught us so long now that everybody is important and that nobody is disposable. So help us to get it right the way that you created humanity. And there, we've learned so much from other cultures, Father. We're, our lives have been enriched by the immigrants. And we want to thank you, Father, for what you're saying, what you're doing, that you, we would just pray that you would preserve us as a nation and that the hearts of humanity in America would be changed and turned to the heart of God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.